Hi, I'm Matt, and we've got Richard and Dave here from Understanding E and eSellerCafe.com. And what have we got lined up for you in this weekly news roundup for e-commerce? Uh, topic number one is going to be Amazon Handmade goes after another Etsy segment. So it looks like Etsy is under pressure there. We'll find out about that in a few moments' time. eBay messaging <clears throat> looks like it's going to catch you for off-site sales going through their messaging system. Google aims to solve advertising attribution problem. That one is a curious. If you've got no idea about that one, you will find out about that in a few moments' time. Also, Dave, you recently wrote an article on three ways which eBay can compete with Amazon. That one's a really curious one. You're going to find out about that again very, very shortly. Two, sorry, three more topics which we're going to cover today. Uh, Facebook launches an Instagram placement for click to messenger ads. That looks pretty cool. There's a really curious one. Is the deal with Amazon regards to PayPal? Is that going to be a bad deal for you when it comes to eBay? Who knows? And it's the game's not all over for Magento version 1.9 and onwards because there's some news around that too. So those are the topics which we're going to be talking about and discussing, discussing live here with you today. Uh, so Richard, what's going on with Amazon Handmade? And uh, they're going straight after Etsy again, I take it. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess. Uh, if uh, NC is down, you might as well pounce on them and trying to get the uh, bits and pieces of their market share. So um, a big market for Etsy was um, wedding stuff and, um, you know, handmade things, unique things, so all the stuff that you kind of use for, for wedding, especially nowadays people want to do something unique that do it yourself first, you know, not necessarily get a wedding planner, but trying to do save some money, but make it come out really unique. So. Amazon launched a segment or a section or page where they took existing product that was already on Amazon and then added additional categories from the handmade and put it on a page that just directly goes after weddings. Um, and that includes not just the wedding day, but also everything leading up to it. I assume the stag party, so on. I didn't find any green stickers, um, Dave, but uh, maybe that's something you could uh, uh, add to later. <laughs> but in any case, um, <laughs> By the way, those of you who don't know what Richard's talking about just there, is Dave recently had his stag weekend and he had some special green stickers which got stuck on random strangers. Uh, so yeah. you that one. Exactly. So <laughs> there's a market yeah, there. Through it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it looks like, you know, even so there's uh, some positive things going on with Etsy um, as far as with the management changes and stuff. But in the meantime, um, clearly, Amazon is seeing an opportunity, and maybe some of the folks that were not really happy to move over to Amazon uh, from Etsy into the handmade uh, uh, sections or categories might be looking at it again because you got to you can't have all your eggs in one basket. So I think this is a good opportunity, and it's a three hundred billion dollar market here in the U.S. So whoa, yeah, huge market. I guess we have also lots of divorces to go with weddings, so therefore you can get repeat business. Um, and in that case... <laughs> Ever the optimist there, Richard. Yeah, well. <laughs> On a serious point, I was actually also hinting that there's a certain life events where sometimes cash is no object, and weddings is one of the obvious ones, but also um, first child uh, and childbirth is also a massive area as well. How long do you reckon it's going to be till we see a news item coming out where Amazon's gone chasing that uh, to, to tackle or to go head on with Etsy. Well, I think it's just a matter of time because if you look nowadays on Amazon, at least on the US side, you can already see on the handmade part categorizations for certain life events. Um, so they have already added life events as a drill down menu. And now it's just a matter of taking that into a full-blown page, which is ex really what they've done with weddings. They've just made it into a, a unique page that is logical for weddings, and you could do the same thing for other life events. So it makes a lot of sense to go down um, on all those life events. Fantastic. And by the way, if you would like to know more about what's going on with Amazon and Etsy, uh, the links to all of the articles which we're discussing is down in the video description underneath this video. Uh, over on YouTube. Cool beans, cool beans. Now, what's this about eBay messaging now catching more attempts to sell offline? And before you even answer that, 
is this just a futile effort by eBay to try and like plug in a few of the gaps? Would, well, would it, would it been better time, effort, and energy, maybe by eBay spent on spending more money on advertising, for example? You know, and actually, I have uh, something in the works uh, for this week to come out about advertising because eBay is doing a lot there. Um, so. Um, yeah, it does seem like a little futile effort and, and a little childish in, in some ex uh, uh, to some respect that they're going after all these, you know, you can't put up your phone numbers in there, you can't do this. Now they're going to actually improve the AI to be able to dissect information that is written to see if you are attempting to sell outside. And what is really hard with this, and, and one of the examples that, that I was shown why I wrote this article was the seller, I mean, sorry, the buyer had actually asked to do the transaction off eBay to save money. So then the seller said, sure, we can do that. And that's when the whole thing unraveled. Um, so it's a, it's a, almost a trap now you have to look at. You know, if a, if a buyer asks you to go offline, you're going to have to pretty much say no, you know, because uh, else it's going to count against you. You know, that, that there's no other way around this. And, and, and uh, the, you know, the small benefit of an offline sale that you might have um, isn't really worth the aggravation of dealing with eBay. And quite frankly, I think for most sellers, you know, if, if you're dealing with $20 or $30 items, it's really, I mean, how much time and effort are you going to put into, into communicating with people? But if you're selling higher priced items, five, six, eight hundred dollar items, yeah, then 10% can make a difference to a to a buyer. And and you might end up with a lost sale in those cat those type of categories if you can't you know get something done and and unfortunately there really isn't you know they get very clever i mean the, the there was two emails that i saw and, and in both situations the the um the way the, the the emails direct emails from ask was really very clever and and i must admit i was very surprised that uh that ebay caught them so they clearly have been looking at lots of lots of emails internally on on how people are getting around this policy that had actually existed for years it's just now they're enforcing it more so yeah it, it's, a real, it's a real curious one and it, again this is probably going to impact the smaller business owner which uses ebay rather than the larger ones with, well maybe the larger ones which are doing a higher transaction volume so a higher number of uh, orders every single day they're just going to go eh, that's not going to affect them at all because right. they're not going to take it off ebay because it's easier for them to run through their existing processes and it's just easier for them. So do you feel this this is perhaps going to affect the like the the personal user if that makes sense some someone selling the odd couple of items more than say a business owner on eBay? I don't know. I think the personal user likes the idea of eBay being sort of in between as a um um, you know, to make sure the transaction goes smoothly. So I'm, I think it's mostly sellers of, of specific categories that are dealing with higher priced items that don't have a lot of volume in those categories where these type of questions probably come up more often than not. Um, so I, I, I don't know. It just seems a little petty in my opinion. I think I can't imagine that leakage is such a huge problem, but, you know, maybe it's just part of their way of trying to, you know, internally learn, you know, they are obviously part of, uh, of trying to get internal um, uh, for searching the uh, artificial intelligence uh, factor, you know, better, you know, so maybe this is part of the play to work on. I, I don't know. It just seemed really childish, in my opinion. Um, I understand what they're trying to do, but really, I mean, it's not like they're, they're, they're not, they're losing money. I don't, I don't see that, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, Ch changing topic. What's this about Amazon aiming to, let me just get this right. Uh, sorry, Google aims to solve advertising attribution problem. Now, before we get into the meat of this, Richard, can you explain what that actually means and why that would be of interest to us as business owners? Yes, so let's say you have a marketing campaign and you have banner ads on a website, okay, and you're using a a Google AdSense to deal with them. Then you have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, in Gmail, you you put uh, you you purchase um, PPCs. Um, you buy a banner, some some other, you know, entity maybe within Google. So you have all these different steps, and and this also includes steps, for example, like if you have a um, uh, retail store and and 
uh, a phone comes close to a retail store so it starts popping up information. I mean, Google has developed all these different marketing ways. Well, what happens is usually, traditionally in marketing, uh, when you get your marketing reports, you look at the last click, which is when, when did the conversion happen? And you say, oh, look, it happened when somebody clicked on this banner or somebody clicked on this link. And you attributed the entire marketing campaign to that last click or, or, or you know, weighed it that way. So you said, this last click is really the one that's working the best. Well, what was never, or what was really, that's not really correct because it may be the last click that was the final decision maker for the buyer, but he might have been, quote unquote, bombarded five, six, seven, eight times prior to that with your ad through, um, through other means. So, so the whole idea is to expand that process to show you what the flow was, what did the uh, buyer see, which ads that they react to, or which ads that they see, and then you can say, okay, so much of the revenue is really attributed to a multiple sources of advertising, not just one source of advertising, and they'll give you a much better clue where to spend more of your money. You might find that the last click is just a convenience to some extent, but the meat of it might be some banner ad you're running on a forum that you're sponsoring, for example, that that is really where most of it gets triggered into a purchase. So, you you know, the initial trigger of looking then down the road, that's what, what this is supposed to help you identify. And obviously every business is different. It's gonna take a little time to, to massage this, but the best part about it is it is free. If you're using Google's advertising platform, this is completely free. There is an enterprise version which gets into television uh, ads and other offline stuff that they can somehow track, um, which does cost money. But let's face it, unless you're Coca-Cola or Pepsi or, or you know of that size, that's not going to be uh, you're not going to be spending those kind of ad dollars. So for the average person, the free um, uh, attribution software, I think they're calling it Google Attribute, is going to be what you need and what you want to use. And I think it really will help you open your eyes in where to spend your marketing dollars and what's really happening and not just attribute everything to the last click. Yeah, this is very much a curious one because as a user for, for my own business is that we use Facebook, we use Google Ads, we even use Bing Ads as well. It would be curious to see if they're only keeping within uh, the Google Ad Network or are able to expand out any further than that. That, that will be very much an eye opener. But yeah, the way I, 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 I watched the entire right. video uh, uh, presentation on it, mm -hmm. it was on YouTube. And it appears to me they are trying to incorporate these other networks as much as possible as well. And just to be fair, Facebook is doing something similar, but I believe Facebook's is purely based on Facebook's advertising platform. Um, so there are some limitations, but Google is trying to go, it's, you know, they obviously always highlight theirs, but then they say, and others, you know, so yeah. others is everybody else because for this to work and have, meaning others need to be part of it else it's only going to yeah, be we, we need to see the, like the whole picture of what's going on so it's a it's a it's a good challenge because you're right you, yes. you were saying earlier is that you just don't you may it may look like you so maybe you've just started going to do some ppp uh, ppc or some pla ads for example is that it may look like the, the end of the chain is working exceptionally well and that's where you're getting all your conversions from but in reality, it might have been, like Richard, you suggested, an ad which you're running in a forum somewhere, somewhere else, which looks completely unrelated, but actually it's that one which got you and your business in front of the customer uh, in the first place. And the last, like you said, Richard, the last piece is almost like a cursory step for them to go on because you just nudged them in the right direction. Yeah, for so, how many sites did they visit in the meantime? Exactly. Absolutely. Okay, moving on. And we're, we've got eight topics or so to cover today. So we are keeping the pace going pretty quickly today. So eBay, final remi reminder, right? The active content policy is here literally two days time. So on the 7th of in June already, blow it, well, June or 7th of June is <laughs> eBay's active content 
cut off. Richard, what's your thoughts on this? Dave, feel free to uh, chime in as well. Get it done. If you have been lazy for the last, whatever, six months, you have two more days. You know, I mean, really what, what has already happened, and I could tell that from some tests that I've done on eBay, when I switched over certain things from active content to non-active content, they got indexed better. So clearly eBay already started to downgrade active content stuff even before this deadline. So if you've noticed a drop in sales on some of your listings uh, and, and they still have active content in it, that's probably a big part of it. So get it done. Yeah, Simple. I think I, I've seen a lot of people complain um, at certain meetups that I've been to and, and other uh, on other websites and forums and stuff. And it, and I just don't think you have grounds to complain right now. It's like eBay have given you pretty much a year's notice that this was happening. Um, you know, it's on you if you if you, you know, it, I, you know, Amazon wouldn't have given you a year's notice. Put it that way. So, you know, for, no, they were probably think... giving you about 14 days and then told you on the seventh day on the way through. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or well, they would have told you yeah. a day after. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I'm going to give you 14 days and then tell you to pound sand. Exactly. You got a year <laughs> with eBay, you know. <clears throat> well, I would say, if you, again, if anyone who's not done it yet, uh, and again, Matt probably won't do it because he's too modest, but check out Widget Chimp. Um, I know Matt's been super busy uh, working on that. And it, like I said, it's. Uh, one, as far as I can see, the best solution which gets over the active content issue and still lets you have fantastic, responsive uh, looking eBay templates. So, and, and I will add yeah. one thing to it. Go on. There is a linkage, a link, you know, issue coming sometime in three months where you have to remove certain links to websites. I actually um, uh, reached out to eBay through a, a tweet and I got a response, and I was I was shocked. Of stating what about sellers that have true actual you know manuals and things like that to provide and I suge suggested how about you incorporate Dropbox Google um, 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 you know cloud services etc you mm -hmm. know as authorized domains and they came back great suggestion we will pass that on <laughs> so <laughs> maybe because right right now in, in September you won't be able to do that also so I mean maybe some people are trying to put the two together a little bit oh I'll wait till September to do everything so I only have to do one revamp no this one you need to get done now and then the second one maybe there's some hope on how to change that to like a Dropbox or some other place from your website and and that will make it easier to update without actually having to change templates that much you know so yeah absolutely and again um, Dave brought it up a shameless plug is that if you didn't know it before I actually am the person behind uh, widgetchimp.com which we make responsive eBay listing templates literally if you go and check your account it was put in there last week uh, if you go and check the menu bar on the top there is a bulk revision tool available and also a, a new tool which literally has gone in this morning uh, ironically uh, so that you can just check up on the rev revisions to make sure if any of them did stop you know which ones they are and you can make those changes and then put them back into the main queue so that you get the option to revise them as well so happy days right moving on three ways ebay could compete with Amazon. Now, Dave, before we get into this topic, this, yes, this is, well, as many of you know, we're, we're pretty much pro eBay here. We, we like, generally speaking, we like eBay. We also like Amazon as well. We also like uh, third party websites as well, because potentially they can make you as much, if not more money compared to the marketplaces. But coming back onto the topic, over the past couple of years, it has been extremely apparent to myself, to Dave, to Richard, and everybody else in the e-commerce industry, that eBay has taken a very concerted effort to, in many ways, duplicate and chase Amazon. For want of a better set of words, they're, they're trying to Amazonify eBay. But Dave, you've come up with three possible ways which eBay could compete with Amazon and carve their future. Would you like to explain I, those a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this this came off the back of uh, the, the Catalyst conference that I went to, and it was very heavily uh, Amazon-centric at times, and eBay were almost shunned to a point. It made me feel a little bit bad um, because 
like Matt said, I love eBay. eBay is a fantastic website. Um, and, and you know, we love Amazon as well. And I just felt that eBay weren't getting the sort of, you know, acknowledgement that they deserved. And after that event, I sort of came back here to the office and was, was sat there thinking, going, well, what – if I – I was, you know, if I was Devin Wayne, what would be the big things I'd be focusing on if I was going to be uh, trying to trying to really push eBay in the right direction? I came up with the three sort of areas that I identified, uh, and of course, if you agree or disagree, let us know in the comments down below. But ultimately, or in the live chat right now, if you're watching live, um, number one was basically that eBay needed to really shout that they're putting sellers first. It's something which you know, Amazon is very much we put buyers first and eBay needs to be along the lines of we put sellers first. And that is the main that that came across very strongly from it comes across from Devin very strongly and it also comes across from uh Pierre uh, who was at the um Catalyst conference. You know, I got the feeling that he genuinely cared and that it was all about putting sellers first and being the platform for sellers. I think there still needs to be a little bit of time for that new sort of ideology within eBay that to, to filter through to the whole of eBay and, and most importantly, seller support level, because I think a lot of sellers aren't getting that feeling when they have to contact seller support. So that's the first one. Second one would be they need to make it much clearer that they're not your competition eBay is never going to compete with you when it comes to you selling products. They want you to sell more of your products. That's how they make their money. And I think there's this blurred line where some people on Amazon don't actually see that Amazon, whilst being a fantastic marketplace, also has the potential to put you out of business. You know, me and Matt have seen it firsthand. I'm sure, Richard, you have as well in, in your sort of industry. Um, Amazon just has immense buying power they are ruthless, they're a business first and a marketplace second, and eBay needs to sort of bring in that trust issue that they can that you can now trust eBay. Gone are the days where it was, you know, a bit like a car boot sale, you know, people doing backhand deals and stuff. That, that's <laughs> gone now. You're so well protected on eBay uh, with seller protection, of course, with PayPal protection. I think that is something which they really need to round home. They, they, they could absolutely hammer this to to the point that it would make trade. It would make most businesses second guess trading on Amazon. Yeah. To the point on this piece is that we don't because they because eBay have made steps in the in, pre, in previously here in the background with like Terapy, for example. So you can actually re properly research another seller. Uh, sellers sells on eBay like you used to be able to do with therapy. They've removed that function now, which has taken a big chunk out of therapy, to be honest, because that was one of the main reasons anybody ever used it was to see what their competitors were exactly. selling. So that's one step forwards. And I, I personally think if if eBay really pushed that, then it would put a massive question of doubt around trading on Amazon. It's surprising that they're not pushing this more. Um, with right their communication because they don't have they don't have to say in as many words Amazon will steal your list listing data and then go and source the pro products and directly compete with you. They don't have to say that in no. in very clear language. They just have to say that we will never compete with you. Yeah, that's exactly. I was just going to make that final point. You've absolutely nailed it. They don't have to be blatant about it and just say. Amazon are going to steal your product data and go right to your suppliers. They just need to be subtle with it and just you know reinforce that trust amongst eBay, and that is almost sowing the seeds of doubt on Amazon. So it's it's a subtle one, and it's one that I really think they should pursue more heavily. Well, I think they should also, also do a good job with that. By you know, I mean, Walmart is right now expanding their marketplace, and they're going to do the exact same thing that Amazon did, which is, you know, they're going to take data. The of sales data, so they could, they could, you know, actually the the article they are going after Amazon. And the article I'm, I'm working on right now deals with an ad that that eBay started um, using here in the United States that is directly. I think it says, you know, shopping doesn't have to be beige and boring or something like that. And there's a clear yes um, 
you know this uh, 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 you know uh, attempt there to distance them themselves from Amazon, but as uh, Walmart grows, he, they could make the case of we are a marketplace only. We don't have other agendas mm -hmm. like the other marketplaces. You know they could in the word Amazon. So um, yeah, absolutely. And, and again, like I said, Walmart is a retailer first. It's what they do. They sell products and. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing that makes eBay unique is that they are not selling products. Um, so again, that's the interesting one. Uh, and I know exactly the sort of theme with the advertising because like right now I'm seeing so much social adverts from eBay in terms of Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, they're everywhere. And I think their big summer thing in the UK, at least I've seen is, a, is a, like you say about being colorful and, and that don't be not being beige. So, they're definitely trying to attract the younger audience with some sort of fun, colorful advertising. We'll see if it works. But I, I think the core message for me would be we're not we're not going to compete with you. If they want serious businesses to start selling on the platform, they need to make it seem like a partnership uh, and, you know, along those lines. That's how I would paint it anyway. And number, third, number three in the list of, of the three ways eBay could compete with Amazon is just to innovate again. I think it's been so long since we've seen any meaningful innovation with eBay. Uh, the last one that sort of sticks to my mind here in UK is the click and collect thing that they did with Argos. Uh, and even then, that wasn't, you know, it's not that revolutionary. Um, but you look at Amazon and literally every month, We've seen it in in these roundups. You know, Amazon are bringing out something new. They're doing, you know, it's a new Amazon Echo with a screen on it, and there's a new, you know, the drones, you know, stuff. It's they they're constantly working on new things. I just think eBay. I know it's hard when you're not selling your own products and you're not, you know, a retailer, but there has to be innovation coming from eBay to get people excited to to make life easier for sellers. Um, you know, me and Matt have had discussions behind the scenes just regarding software, which would make people's lives easier. Why aren't eBay going down this road? It would make perfect sense, really. I know. One, one area that I don't understand that they haven't done is, and, and you know, DHL is doing a big push in the United States now, which is not really a big name, so to speak, in, in, in the U.S. as far as... Um, it's not um, in the UK, to be honest, either. <laughs> no, I mean, you guys are FedEx, UPS, yeah. UF, yeah, the UFPS, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, so FedEx has already had for years these fulfillment centers in Memphis, um, which is a very, you know, strategically good location for mm -hmm. the U.S. Why they don't do something with one of them and say, "Look, let's bring in eBay fulfillment through a partner," you know, and and at least make that as an offer for some people. I mean, that would be like a huge step, you know. Yeah, you're not going to be able to do the Amazon thing with 50 warehouses and all this yeah. and that. It's just, but but just doing that, that would be a, a great innovation, you know, to, mm -hmm. to incorporate that into the platform. And and that wouldn't be that much different from the global shipping program that they, that they, yeah. and, and yet here we go again, the global shipping program, they sort of put it out there and we haven't really heard much about it. And you know, I, I know some people don't like it. I'm one one of the ones that actually think that a lot of buyers don't like it. But 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 at least keep pushing it. You know, and maybe you get more sellers involved, and then then um, you get more buyers eventually. So, but anyways, that goes. It's going down a different path here. But yeah, there, there's definitely areas they could do, especially with fulfillment, to make life easier. Why isn't there an UPS discount program for every eBay seller, a FedEx discount program for eBay seller? I mean. Yep. If you, if you join XYZ Association, they throw them at you already. You know, I mean, it's it's little things like that that could really make a big difference. I, I and that's, don't get that's that. That's the thing which is annoying, I think, because everyone right, right now is watching this, hopefully is, is entrepreneurial. You're probably running your own business. You solve problems. That's what you do as an entrepreneur. And, and eBay needs to look. I mean, I'm sure they get millions of feedback every month about what's gone wrong with eBay. Right. Make pe make sellers' lives easier, fix problems, add convenience. That's how you win. And I just don't think we've seen enough of that. Uh, and that's that should be a focus. I'd have a team of people dedicated to innovation and convenience uh, for, for people who were selling on eBay. And like you said, Richard, fulfillment has to be one of them. Yeah, because if he's listening, we're, we're here. We will help you. Just send us a big check. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I think um, Dave's hit a really interesting point there is that 
a dedicated team to looking at it from a, a separate team is probably as best uh, where you've got a dedicated team which can make the seller's lives easier and also in a flip side a team which is dedicated towards making the customer's life easier as well because if you've got two independent teams working separately bring them together once per month and see what's what they're what they're discussing what areas they're picking up the reason being is because one of the obvious ones, like Richard just brought up a few moments ago about postage. Uh, well, here in the United Kingdom of Royal Mail, I dread to imagine how many eBay items go through their network on a daily basis. USPS, for example, in the United States. Well, then you look at that from a seller's point of view and you look at that from a buyer's point of view and you get the two teams together and they're both screaming at you, do something with USPS or do something with Royal Mail. Do something that you've got the kind of got the answer, and that's that's just the low hanging fruit, you know. Um, so well, to be yeah, fair, eBay they do have a new USPS program, but the problem with USPS in the United States is that once you go over a certain package size, everything is priority mail, um, and and that becomes not efficient price wise, you know. So you know, UPS has a, such a strong following here in e commerce because. They are competitive because they um, they can take any size boxes, you know. So so I, I do have to be fair to eBay that they do have a USPS program, but you know they're missing a big goal here. It's not enough. Right, cool, mate. Right, let's move it on. Richard, we were going to discuss Facebook launches Instagram placement for click to messenger ads. What's that in plain English, Richard? Well, that is in plain that English. Sense. Click a button, uh, click an, on an ad, and Messenger pops up. So that's probably to simplify it down to the, what they're trying to accomplish. Um, it's um, you know, it's a great way. I mean, Facebook and the F eight. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've got my hand up. Does this link into our previous conversation about chatbots? Yes, it does. It 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 goes into chat uh, uh, bots. It goes into all of that. Um, it you know doing F8 Facebook said they're going to expand and want to expand Messenger into sort of like the global yellow pages. So this they had some versions of this already on Facebook. So now they expanded it to Instagram. And I think Instagram is kind of unique because it's all picture related. So if you're selling handbags or if you're selling fashion items and you you put them sort of in the stream and and then uh, you know and, and they show up as an ad and you people click on it and, and immediately it opens up a conversation with the seller. Or, 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 you know, I think that's a um, uh, it's a good way to market and and it's um you know it's not as maybe in your face as, as other marketing would be and I, I think it's a I, I think it gives Instagram so the next leg up into into what to do and um, um, with their social you know network because it's sort of like the one that Facebook owns and you yeah it's got a lot of users. And, and the only time I ever think of Instagram is when it pops up. This person is now following you on Instagram from your Facebook, you know, users. But they obviously need to incorporate more advertising opportunities, more business opportunities into um, um, into Instagram. And I think this is a great step in the right direction. Yeah, it is a real curious one because whereas, say, eBay and Amazon want to help facilitate the transaction through their platform if that makes sense and they'll take a percentage of sell is that with facebook advertising for example because they've pretty much shunned e-commerce to for all intents and purposes they could have done something with e-commerce for a very very long period of time and it's always just been very meek if that makes sense as far as facebook goes but if they can do the click to add so the advertising window it's a click through for example or an ad to a click through to a messenger app they're integrating their different parts of their businesses they're integrating facebook with the messenger with instagram then is that not just like easier money if that makes sense then just to just like let people interact and let people talk which is what people do the best or do the most like is it not yeah, absolutely. You know, and and if um, and if Messenger becomes a de facto, you know, B two C um, uh, messaging tool, that's a that's a great way to um, uh, or communication tool. You know, I then that's globally. That is, I mean, then you you don't. It's not no longer just eight hundred numbers. You know, or or of toll free numbers. Now you have other ways to communicate. You know, I mean, I think you know eBay when they purchased Skype initially, I thought. I think that's what they thought they're going to turn Skype into many, many moons ago. Um, and um, 
but they just didn't have the the ideas correct on how to do that. And I think you know Facebook obviously has the users that they can turn turn Facebook Messenger into a global communication platform that will become as important as email and telephones. And and, and I think that this is just part of the whole process that they're going after. So. Another interesting one to follow, you know, just uh, here we go again, innovation. And as we talked, eBay hasn't been doing much of that, but others are. Um, yeah. So, Okay, did, move, moving on, we've got two topics less, and we're going to do our best to wrap those up within 10 minutes or nine minutes or less. The first one is that this is, I believe you wrote this one article, uh, Richard, which was, is an Amazon deal with PayPal bad news for eBay? Can you explain that a little bit more? And those of you which are on the live version, I'll pop that in the chat uh, for you uh, so you can have a read. Uh, and of course, if you are watching the recorded version, links to all the topics which we're covering are down in the video description for you. So Richard, why would it be bad news for eBay? Actually, it's a Dave article. <laughs> oh, it's a Dave article. All right, I've heard that one correctly. Dave and Richard, why is this yep. bad news for eBay? Well, this is um, this is back in January, I believe. There was uh, reports that uh, PayPal and Amazon were having talks, and uh, the CEO of PayPal, Dan, famously came out and said, "We've been in conversations with Amazon, uh, and we're closing in on 200 million users on PayPal right now. Uh, and at that scale, it's hard for any retailer to think about not accepting PayPal. So we know that they've. It was a little bit cryptic, but you're sort of bigging up PayPal, saying, "Listen." We have 200 million users. Why wouldn't Amazon want to offer PayPal as, a, as an option on the checkout? Uh, and it came out this week that, oh, sorry, last week, that um, this sort of relationship has started, albeit very slowly in, in sorts of partnership terms. You obviously, PayPal isn't on checkout on Amazon yet, but what PayPal have done is on PayPal's website, um, the let me find the link uh paypal hyphen gifts.com which is basically is that a, a sort of a smallish site which paypal use for, for gift cards mainly uh over on the american site you can now buy amazon gift cards from the paypal site which has never been able to be done previously ebay have their own sort of version of this site teamed with paypal and you can't buy Amazon gift cards from that site, but from PayPal's own site, you can. Um, so at the minute, this is like a very small step, but it obviously shows that conversations have been being had in the background. And ultimately, if you're eBay, this is not good news because it's almost like seeing your ex-girlfriend walking around with a supermodel. It's like, oh, you know, she's sort of upgraded to the bigger more more popular marketplace <laughs> and she's sort of getting in bed very slowly with them and it's, you know, yeah, it must it's, be it's a not bit... somewhat inevitable that the communication or that the, the it will happen at some point paypal will be on amazon but what why is it this bad for ebay is this not going to be good for ebay i'm just playing the advert devil's advocate here as far as ebay is concerned well there's more users on paypal so there's more people which can potentially buy on ebay uh is that the wrong way of looking at it? I don't know. Well, well I think that it's a psychological blow more than, than than anything else because of the fact that both of them were together. Um, you know, I think I did. You know, I did write an article earlier in the in the, in the year, and I think that's why um, Matt got to us a little confused on that. That, that talked about a uh, uh, PayPal. Um, you know, being in talks with Amazon, and I, if I recall now correctly from that article, I think there's like 15 billion dollars in in funds in PayPal. You know, among all the users, or so an average of 75 dollars that per user is is available in funds. So, that, so it's it's a payment vehicle. It is becoming as important as Visa, uh, Mastercard, you know, or American Express. And so it is. You know, PayPal is slowly turning into that kind of. Um, um, payment vehicle, and 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 I think that is why Amazon, over the long term, cannot um, look beyond PayPal because if money is sitting there, there's opportunity to be had. Um, so for eBay, it's bad because in some ways, yeah, that was sort of money that was always used, you know, mostly on eBay purchases, and now they're going to go 
go for that. But if at the same time it you go from 200 million users to 300 million users, maybe over the long term it will not Im impact eBay. So I think it's a, a bit of a psychological blow, and and maybe a short term issue as as some of that money may become. You know, if today you're buying something, you see something on two marketplaces, and one on eBay, one on Amazon, and you have a hundred dollars in your PayPal account, where are you gonna go? You go to the eBay one because you already have the hundred bucks in then PayPal. You know, if you now can use it on both, obviously now you make those two marketplaces will compete. So that is the downside for eBay. Um, you know, in a nutshell, on the short term, I think long term will be fine, but on the short term, yeah, there, there's definitely some, you know, some some leakage that will happen then to to Amazon if they were to fully incorporate PayPal into their checkout process. Okay. And the last topic for today's e-commerce roundup uh, with eSeller Cafe is it's not all over for Magento version 1.1. We've got some good news. Indeed. Dave, indeed. what's the good news? Yeah, yeah this I'm is... woken up in Magento. Like, oh, we've got so many stores. We, we can't retire them that quickly. Well, what's the deal yeah. there, Dave? I'm wondering if we're semi-responsible for this, Matt, because I think we've literally been telling people since, you know, November last year when Magento 2 was released, saying, don't jump ship yet. It isn't ready. It's especially not ready for multi-channel. Um, and they, uh, this was a few months ago, Magento had, had reportedly come out and put an end date on uh, Magento 1, or should I say not an end date, but an end of life in terms of support updates. And they had initially stated that in November 18, all subsequent updates from Magento 1 would stop and the whole team would focus on Magento 2. And on, uh, well, last week, Magento have since come out now and stated that they are basically expanding the life of Magento 1. Um, uh, Jason Woosley, who's the Senior v VP of Products and Technology, had come out and said, Magento stands behind our customers and will never leave a customer behind. Uh, you can rest assured that we uh, that we have your back at every turn. Magento One has been and will continue to be supported for the foreseeable future. We have no no intention of denying access to our world class software and know your business relies on Magento to drive growth and differentiation for your brand. So that is good news, and that obviously that that came out on the Magento blog last week. Now. Bit extra to that is I spotted over on Twitter uh, Mark Lavelle, who's current CEO of Magento. Someone uh, commented on uh, Twitter under that tweet saying, "That's interesting, but what does it mean? Are you saying November 18 is being pushed back to December 19?" And Mark replied saying, "It means we'll be announcing extended support grow program for Community Edition, considering a minimum 18 months beyond November 18." So if that is 18 months beyond November 18, that takes you into 2020 of Magento 1, which is three years away. Um, so again, that's great news if you're on uh, Magento 1. Uh, me and Matt and you know Rich as well, I've been saying that Magento 1 is the platform to use if you're a Magento customer right now. Magento 2 still isn't ready. We personally think it was released a little bit early. Um, <laughs> And and in, in November, which is the worst possible time for anyone. Sorry to talk over you, Dave. What's yeah. that? Sorry. Sorry to talk over you there, but we could see that one coming. Magento yeah. 2 was released far too early. Far too early. Yeah. And it's one of those. It's been hard for me and Matt. So we're sort of known for Magento content. And literally, ever since that day, we get asked on a weekly basis, is Magento 2 ready yet? Is Magento 2 ready yet? Is Magento 2 ready yet? And the answer is no. Magento 1 is still the superior platform to be on. And off the back of this news, it sounds like it's going to be continued to be supported for a much longer time. And it's almost like we've, you know, reduced the panic stations a little bit now. That You know, that urgency of having to switch yeah. has gone even further into the future. It was already a good 18 months away to, from now. And now it could be three years away. I, I genuinely do wonder if Magenta have done themselves more damage by releasing such. Um, and I, I, I need to verify what I'm about to say because I really like Magento too, from a user's point of view, like from mm -hmm. the uh, the administrator point of view, because it's really straightforward to use. So on a day-to-day -day basis, it's an awful lot easier. But it was blatantly not ready 
I would, it was a beta product and it felt like an alpha product, which was actually being used by known people. Whereas a beta program, you've got, you put it out and you don't actually know the tester. Uh, it felt very much like that. It still feels very much like that, which is such a, such a pity. And I think they've probably done themselves an awful lot of damage by releasing Magento 2 with so much faith that it was going to be much better than 1.9. And the reality was so many extension providers came out and rubbed up against Magento and said, no, it's not ready. For me as a, and I'm not, I'm going to put myself, I'm going to say myself as an intermediate user of Magento, it was blatantly obvious it wasn't there. That's for sure. The, the processes made it much, much more difficult for the average user to go on and use Magento 2 is something which we're going to have to struggle with now uh, into the future. But I am 100% glad that they're going to extend it for an extra 18 months on, on top of what they were suggesting before. Because right now, Magento 1.9, that's that that strain of Magento, kicks 2. Point whatever's butt, hands down. Uh, and if I was in, frankly, if I was in your shoes, I wouldn't touch Magento 2 with a 10 foot barge pole for at least another year, probably two, to be brutally honest, mm -hmm. because Magento 1.9, it works. There are so many stores which use 1.9. There are so many extensions out there. Why would you cause yourself so much anxiety and trouble and challenges mm -hmm. trying to use a beta piece of software when you've already got a perfectly good platform there? It's called Magento 1.9. And apologies, gents. We just pushed, pushed ourselves over time. We were doing so well uh, on the timing, uh, and I have gone off on a bender. About That's I mean, let, me, let me add a couple of quick things yeah. to that. It's like, it's, I think WooCommerce has in the last year taken off a lot more than probably Magento. Oh yeah, I love WooCommerce. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So I think that's that's been one thing. I think when people are looking at at Magento and it's like, well, I want two, you know, whatever we could do. Some people that don't have more than a thousand items or ten thousand items in their store say, you know what? Let me look at WooCommerce, and wow, it works, you know, for that type of store. And there's most stores are that size, so that's number one. Number two, there's another company called Oro Commerce, which is um, a B two B platform that comes from original Magento developers. I think it's starting to take a bite out of it um, uh, slowly but surely in the B two B world. Um, and what's interesting when you look at the Magento's last conference, the developer conference, so I forgot what they're called there, so I can't keep track of all these names. Um, <clears throat> um, that was like a month or so ago, you know, Magento announced an awful lot of things for Magento 2, which were really enterprise level uh, stuff that requires, you know, um, uh, huge hardware, um, uh, you know, server, uh, server space, blah, 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 whatever. It, it, it's all really mostly aimed at enterprises. And it, it almost seems like that they're taking Magento 2 now into this enterprise level platform and, and realize that maybe Magento 2 will never be a community edition platform in the long run. And maybe that's part of the reason why they chose to, to at least extend 1.9. And maybe they've also gotten a lot of pushback from enterprise customers saying, hey, you know, you want us to go to this thing, but what what is, you know, big businesses don't like change. You know, they just don't like that kind of fundamental change. I mean, there's not even a there's not even a way. You can't even just just upload Magento 2.1 over 1.9 um, um, installation and everything works. It has to be this huge transition, and it's just like. Again, I, and Richard, you've hit the nail on the head there. It's a huge transition, which makes it extremely costly. The the, uh, the 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 system integrators are just going to have an absolute field day with this because yeah. they're going to make so much money out of it. So the probably the only people which are really happy about Magento two are the system integrators, the people which help implement sites and implement businesses into actually use Magento. They're just going to make so much money because two is a slightly higher number. The 1.9, and that's what's <laughs> going to happen. It's going to end up at director level, and they go, "No, I want Magento 2. Point whatever, because it's higher than 1.9." That's basically the logic which you're going to get at boardroom level, um, unless there's someone in there talking sense into them, going, "You must be nuts. Keep it on 1.9. Wait out for a year, two, maybe even three years, 
to see what Magento 2 actually is. And that's what we're to. looking at now. We're looking at three more holiday seasons, basically. Mm. You know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's, you... No, there's no reason to change. And, and companies like Best Buy, I believe their website is based on Magento. It's you know, highly modified. But mm. you know, again, why would they want to change to something completely new? It just, it, you know, and and integrate it, you that know. with other stores, you know, and all yeah. that. Yeah, we, we, we're all, like Matt said, Matt, Matt, more so than me. I'm probably novice to intermediate Magento user, but knowing how Magento works, can you imagine the logistics of trying to replace Best Buy's system? That's a nightmare I wouldn't want. Um, no. and but system like said, integrated, would it? Because they charge them an absolute oh, charge them millions for that job, millions. But I think for me, that one of the fundamental problems with Magento is that you think back to when eBay owned it. eBay had Magento, and they sort of didn't know what to do with it um it was what it worked and they weren't that bothered if it was profitable because back then they had paypal as well and stubhub and marketplace was big and it just felt like a platform which they they did they, that i think that's where the community aspect all sort of stemmed from was that's like oh yeah that'd be cool if it could do this because cool it could do that and then obviously when it was bought by a private firm their whole concept was right right we need to make bringento make money how to do that? Right, release two, and you know, change the fee structure for you know plugins, extensions, blah blah blah, and ultimately they've chased the money and it's failed. I've heard Whereas, honestly, Dave, I, I I sincerely feel that it's backfired on them releasing it so. Oh, so absolutely. Early. Instead of chasing giving value, they chase money and it's failed. Maybe Amazon will buy it. <laughs> 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 right <laughs> on that bombshell because it's entirely my fault that we have gone over time it's time for us to wrap up now before we go i'm going to quickly recap the topics which we covered today and remember the links to everything which we've been and discussed is in the video description underneath this video for you click on the show more link uh, there's links to all the articles which we've discussed uh, of either on eSeller cafe so we talked about amazon handmade goes after another business segment again we're expecting for them to go after baby uh, products next that would be the most logical place for them to go ebay messaging has suddenly got a little bit smart and they're clearing up some leakage on the site we have that discussion around that uh, google is trying to solve the advertising attribution problem which is a big problem in advertising like we were discussing Final reminder for the eBay active content policy. You've got two days to get your listings up to scratch. Okay, and a shameless plug for widgetchimp.com, responsive templates, and you still get some um, ability, you get still get some ability to change the way your templates look and feel. <laughs> we have three ways which eBay could compete with Amazon. That was a very interesting topic. Dave's written a nice big article on there, not Richard. The link to that is in the video description for you. Uh, Facebook launches an Instagram placement uh, for click to messenger ads. So Instagram, open a messenger. We had about a chat about this, the, the messenger potentially being the global communication network of the future. Very curious one, that one. We also discussed whether a deal with PayPal and Amazon is going to be a bad thing for eBay. I don't know. I actually feel we had a really balanced argument about that one, discussion about that. Remember, you can let us know your comments and your thoughts about anything which we've been discussed here live, either as a comment underneath this video or over on the articles over on eSeller Cafe. And the last one, it's not all over for Magento One, and we just discussed that one. And again, you can let us know what your thoughts are, uh, either in the comments section underneath this video, of course, or on the article over on eSellerCafe.com. So on that note, I would like to say a special thank you to you for joining us here for this live session. And of course, Richard, based in the United States, and David, based in Mancunia, aka Manchester, also here in the United Kingdom. Thank you ever so much, gents. I've really enjoyed today. It's been fun. It's been fun. It's been good chat. Good chat. Long one, but good one. All right, everybody. <laughs> Have a good and week. We'll see you next Monday. Absolutely. And remember, same time next week, new topics. We'll keep you up to date what's been going on in the world of e-commerce. We'll see you next Monday, same time. Cheerios. Bye-bye. Have a good one, guys. Bye.